getting some bits out of it for yourselves and asking asking all sorts of questions. Uh, the chat function for those who uh, aren't particularly Zoom um, um, done that much on Zoom, the chat function. If you go across, I think on the on the menu at the bottom. If you don't have it in that menu, if you click on more, then you get a chance to um, use the chat and um, please ask chat, ask in the chat and I'll be monitoring that to see how we go. So without any further ado, that's a bit of the logistics. Uh, and obviously at the end, give me some feedback because next week we'll all be about taking on board some of the learning points we've had from this week and going from there. So tonight for you guys on the base of what you'd said was for me, I was trying to really focus in on the importance of planning ahead uh, and, and obviously how to execute that. And then really trying to look at the limited scenarios and, and then provide some feedback and some tools to help us do a better job of more consistently making good calls and good decisions um, as we go around the race course. If we get into some boat on boats, understanding opportunities, then that's good. Um, but um, but that will come hopefully through discussions that we'll have. Um, little picture on the left is is me in a in a former life as well doing a little bit of laser sailing. So hopefully I've got a few ideas about slow boat and fast boat sailing that might help. So first bit of first bit of the question: um, What stops you executing your race plan at Limington? That was the question. Does anybody have any other things that they would like to throw into the mix? <laughs> and the worse and more, it's just I picked up a few here that relate into a specific bit of a bit of entertainment we'll have in the first part of this talk. No, everyone happy? Okay. So um, if we take the little bit of a, a theme here about plan, knowing what's going on with the tide know where the marks are um you know hoping for shifts rather than knowing where they'll be sort of those things all come in involved into our environment so should we just work through how we actually make a plan would that be helpful yeah got some thumbs got some nods okay so uh, i'm going to shut up for 10 seconds 20 seconds and you guys are gonna throw suggestions in or write something into chat so what are the key fundamentals of how to make a plan for a, and here's your example, for a, for a northerly with an outgoing tide and it's 15 knots. Rory. Um, so make sure your weather forecast is nice and accurate. I would, uh, me, I'd be monitoring that during the day at work because I'm a bit naughty that way. Uh, <laughs> I'd be thinking about wind bend. And yep. I'd be thinking about making sure that I don't overstand the mark, don't stay too long on starboard. Even yep. though you're going to get the wind bend on port, you're likely to overstand the mark on port. Yeah. I'd be looking to, to think about when you go down, when the opposite occurs. Yeah. And then as you get on the racetrack, look to see where the our race committee put the wind with mark because if they put it in the entrance to Pywell, there's going to be some some localized shifts there and it's just getting into that balance of shifts but actually having a plan i'd probably have an idea about nine or ten o'clock in the morning what's all going to happen before i get out even get to the boat cool so <clears throat> that was um um, just to just to be clear, that was about a uh, southwest and an outgoing tide. Yeah, I think so, the northerly. I did. Sorry, I did say a northerly and outgoing tide. My apologies. Yeah, yeah, northerly and outgoing tide. Yeah. So just so many. So Pete says shift. What is high and low? Recognizing it. Ley lines, transits on a ley line on a women mark. Yeah, yeah. So very good, good similar thinking. So um, really interested here the amount of preparation that people are doing to come up with their plan. And uh, just to pick up on a couple of things I wrote down here listening to Rory, um, not overstanding, Pete then says ley lines, get transit on the ley line uh, on the winner mark if enough time. So does, um, it, it, uh, or do we have nodding faces about how or how we'd have a get a transit on a winner mark? Is that, everybody know how to do that? And I'm pretty happy with that, yeah. Um, 
as Pete says, are very difficult in a cross tide, but it's really useful to try and make sure that for the key marks that we're going to round, we know exactly, or we, we know as precisely as we can about our approach to it. So that when we're under pressure coming into each of the marks, we've got a benchmark, we've got something that's a, a little reminder, a rule of thumb or, or a transit that gives us a visual stimulus about what that means. I'm not sure, uh, sorry, I'm not sure about a transit along the mark, especially in the big shifty breeze in the northerly. How do you find the mean for your transit? Well, you'd um, you'd have to do a you'd have to do a few a few div, a few goes at it and then average it out. You know? okay. So you know, yes, if it yes if it's shifty, but I mean maybe part of it is actually just going and making sure you've gone and approached the mark and seen what the different approaches are to have a little bit of a look at it. And um, you know, I suppose the key bit in there, and maybe it's good to get Pete to keep Pete to contribute at, at this point. Pete, you got any thoughts? Uh, yes, just typed it. Um, the yeah, get a transit on the windward mark, but bear in mind that it's shifting. So that's cheating. You <laughs> you've got a compass. You know if you're high and low. So if you tack and you know you want to lift and you're laying it that's great but if you're laying it on a header right. you've probably overstood it because it'll yeah. lift you before you get to it so you can stay within the ley lines by knowing your shifts on your compass can't you love your work great excellent question excellent answer you know very uh, specific opportunity there for people to to have a bit of a think about and then and, and now and the more that you un understand and know the environment the easier it becomes to be able to really focus in on those details and um, yeah, anybody else yeah i've got a problem with that is that because you don't know what the windward mark is going to be until the committee boat put it up i mean you can guess obviously you can guess uh, so i think pete's saying go up there and you know if it's in go up there and do it if it isn't then obviously it's a little bit trickier Qu quite likely you won't have time to get up there and do it it's a bit of a luxury if you have time to go and do that and do watch out to see if they move a windward mark again afterwards. <laughs> I mean, let me, yeah. to be honest, we only go around six marks and one of them is going to be sat to a bit above a stop. If we're absolutely frank about it, if yeah, we're yeah, cutting, it, if we're cutting it down just, just for here. So you could, you could sail out. If you know it's going to be an orderly, you could sail out and if you're pretty likely to know which one they're going to pick if it's going to be an orderly. So actually, as you sail out, you might be able to sail up towards that you know, towards the mark, you know, it's going to be anyway. As but long as the wind doesn't change too much from half past seven in the morning, Henry, when you first get out there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very likely, On very Wednesday. <laughs> Henry will be wind shift tracking for hours. Yeah. <laughs> for the race. But you can do it on the first beat, the first rounding, and then you're set up for the second lap. Yes, because you can't often do four or five laps, don't yeah. you, whatever it is. Right. Yeah, good show. I love this. I love this. You know, that this is exactly what is really uh, useful about these opportunities for us to get together and do this because, you know, some people obviously use this and there are little ways we can use it. And it's just kind of working into your little plan and working into how you can sort of make the opportunities to make gains around the race course. Um, and I would say also, you know, if you can't get up to the women mark, but you're going to be coming into a lower mark by the start line, then do, do, do get the lower mark approach. You know, people forget about how important it is when you're sailing in a cross tide venue to get a lure mark approach in, right? And you know the amount you gain for coming in with decent speed and not trying to soak in low or not trying to come in with tide across you or whatever is is as much of a gain as trying to get a wind with one. So be really, really crystal that do the things that's practical for you around you when you're in that preparation period before the start, and uh, and, and it will just help add some more colour to the picture that you have of your race course. So great guys, fantastic work there um, on, on that. Uh, the questions we need to answer, well, you know, what information do we need in our race, race plan? And you guys have come up with some really good, really good um, uh, options there. You know, mark the transit, weather forecast, wind bends, no overstanding. I, um, I thought there was a few, you know, for, for, for me being a simpleton, I thought there was a few things. So there's firstly our sailing skills. You know, going out, tack, jive, set up the boat, upwind, downwind, start practice. Henry's going to do three, as we know, every every time he's on the water. 
Yeah, so our sailing skills are something that are part of our race plan, our preparation routine to get to be able to be on the scarp gun, going at speed when we want to, when we come to race. The other thing that um, the other thing that we have is is as um, Rory and Peter and Carl and Henry have all been reminding us is about the environment. So, what is the environment that we work in? And then you know, and then the last bit actually is the competition. You know, who are we racing against? Are we starting in a Wednesday evening where it's every man and his dog and we have lots and lots of different fleets of different types about all starting on the same start line? And we need to factor that in because it's not the same as sailing your expo on a Wednesday afternoon when you're all, all exactly the same sailing on the start line and you kind of you know, you know the dirty wind that you're going to get off an expo because you've sailed against that a lot of the time. Whereas when you sail off your start line on a Wednesday evening, your aero might be sat next to a solo, sat next to a phantom, sat next to a Merlin rocket, sat next to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with the massively different wind shadows. And also, you know that, you know, um, the match races amongst you are going to luff you to the nth degree if you want to get past. Um, and, and how the interaction with the competition also plays a factor in it. So there's some suggestions. Any, anything else that you guys can think of in how we come up with our race plan? No? That's Two, fine. Maybe. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, fast fleet uh, asymmetric, going downwind at a ton of knots, not being able to see anything. Bingo. Yeah, so visibility. Uh, and uh, and you know, and kind of knowing, kind of knowing how long it's going to take you to do the leg. The last thing you want to do is overlay that ley line if you can't really see the small little mark. So getting out and practicing and then being able to sail the course, getting that environment piece right is really super crucial. So so thanks for that, Jeff. Really really cool. So so how do we get this information? And obviously people have mentioned stuff before, but I thought it was just worth us having a little idea a little sort of skulk around you know yes we've we've all should have a course chart um as rory said we've got a weather forecast you know, we obviously know what the tide um the tide high water times etc etc are but um as a question to everybody what do people use for for the different um tide opportunities you know is there a on the on the chair what's the straw poll of what people use as tide flow is it just that we know it goes one way or the other or is there a book that people like to refer to or anything like that top tip is uh whatever you choose use the same one every time and then calibrate it by looking at the fishing floats and marks to check that it's doing what you expect it to do yeah. uh, quite often I, we've seen people in the experts being out by as much as 45 minutes an hour as to when the tide is turning so yeah. do double check by checking the fishing floats because they are a really good telltale as to whether it's working or not and yeah. if you need more on this come to my talk on wednesday evening all about hey. that which mentions fishing floats <laughs> thank you rory <laughs> and I, th I think the other thing with that is i mean rory has served slow boats a bit longer than i have but a slow boat hydrographic survey of the Western Solent is ideal for this. So I don't think anybody knows this better than Rory. No, no. And there, actually, for that, for um, for you guys who want a very sort of back to basics thing as well, um, there is also a talk on the Royal Limited Yacht Club's junior section talks um, talks page, which is being done by Graham Sunderland. So if you want to get back fully back to basics and have a little mental refresher. If you go to the, the Yacht Club's website, go to Getting on the Water, go to Junior section, then down in there you'll find talks. And there's one from Graham that we did he did for us before Christmas. And it is, it is, a, it is a good, really simple start of a 10 um, to just help the youngsters. But a little reminder mightn't be a bad idea. Um, in addition to the fantastic, specific aimed session Carl will be doing on Wednesday. Well, the Royal get Graham, the town get me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah. yeah so 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 course chart weather tide who are your oppo you know and practice those race skills you know that is all pretty simple stuff 
But this is the real nitty gritty. You know? So how do you then stick to your plan? Um, and um, I'll just throw that open. How do you make sure that if you come up with this great plan of where you're going to start, what you're going to do, you actually do stick to it? Good question, Hugh. Yeah. Back a long time ago, back in 20, 2000, in fact, um, I sat through a crew meeting and we talked about it and we kept saying how we quite often changed our plan as the race progressed. And... Um, after about three or four bottles of wine, we came to the conclusion we were committed but flexible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so you know, one of the um, interesting things that I have had many conversations with Joe Glanfield, and Joe's the um, gold medal winning coach for the 470s and has uh, recently been, co uh, in the last couple of years, been coaching um, the British team in the um, F50s um joe's like the biggest mistake most people make is they have a plan they don't actually ever execute the plan or they find some other reason to just not quite get there or not quite deliver and once you spent you know once you've got out to the star line decided what you're going to do it's unbelievable how many times people end up coming up with a reason not to do it so i may have shown some of you this before but um this is just a little idea from, of mine about how to then sort of be able to stick to that plan that you've come up with. Now, we've just talked a little bit about the race plan. Uh, Rory said weather, wind bends, overstanding, down, you know, make sure you've got ley lines, you know, know where the boat, the committee boat is, where the marks are likely to be. So, so really covering off a lot of these sort of um, the environmental side of things and getting to know what you need to do. Then, actually to get to deliver the plan you then need to have a way of you working around the race course to do that then when you get to the pinch points when you meet other boats you need to have set plays or your tactics fully sorted to try and work out how you're going to tackle jibe or whatever or position yourself relative to other people um and then uh uh yeah and then and then the prioritization well so sometimes it's actually really difficult to work out what the right thing to do is You've got a few different ideas in your head. Could I do this? Could I do that? And this sort of speaks to the the um, the point we'll mention in a moment from Simon Gaiman. And, and so I'll, I'll come to that, Simon. But how we actually prioritise when we're in the moment and our, and we're being hijacked by our chimp um, and not necessarily able to deliver because we're getting stressed. Um, we need to just be able to keep to a simple plan uh, because really all we ever do in sailing is is one of two things. It's either we hold or we tack, or jibe. That's all we ever do. All we're ever doing is make a decision of one or the other, effectively. We're making lots of decisions, but all we ever do in terms of changing things on the water is that. So how do we stick to a plan? Keep it simple. Have an approach, have a way of getting from, this is what I want to do, and then being able to execute it. And that's what kind of we're going to, going to go through here. Pete has a nice... Um, suggestion here so pete said uh, buy into the plan single handers talk it out loud yeah you're not going mad um you might be looking at the hairs on the palm of your hand but talking things out loud really um from a from a cognitive re reinforcement perspective is a really really valuable and useful way of ensuring that you do contract to do something with yourself and one of the key ways of learning skills, if you're doing visualizing, some of you might have heard of this, but if you're not able to say, oh, like you have over lockdown and you've seen some video, watched some videos, after you've watched some videos, you can probably picture the image of you doing a tackle drive in your head. One of the really, really super good ways of reinforcing that is to then actually talk it out loud as you're visualizing it. And talking out loud, your plan is the same. Let's go through a little, a little scenario. So you started whew, having developed a plan, um, and uh, you know if we started, so then, then what? You've got off the start line. Say we've actually managed to to start where you wanted to start. What, um, you know, and what are now what, and what are the issues you usually face? So if you've, if we are on the scenario that Rory was talking to earlier, it was a northerly. We've got an outgoing tide. Rory, yeah, you've started. You've started. You managed to start where you wanted to start. 
which might be on an outgoing tide, where might that be? Out towards the middle of the middle of the, the middle of the Solent or towards the towards the shore? So my normal game plan is is to try and avoid getting pinned past the yep. day line. So I would start to windward of the bunch um, and look at being able to tack on to, being able to tack onto port is going to be really, really critical. Yeah. Um, the problem you normally face in an X boat, which you probably also face in, in other boats, is some joker wants to carry on sailing you off to Hurst. Uh, <laughs> and you will have the same, even worse on a Wednesday, I guess, with lots with boats that travel at different speeds. So you, you might ace the start in your area only to find that there's a, a much bigger boat pinning you out to the other corner. So just be able to... yeah to go the way you want to go is really, is almost more important than winning the start. Bingo. Okay, so I've just, um, these these are a few of the additional questions that actually, um, that some of you provided for us earlier, uh, earlier in the week. And so Pete's, Pete's one, lose your lane off the start line on a one-sided course, kind of a similar sort of scenario. Um, Simon, when you see other people doing other things, you know i end up going up the middle and that's that's tricky um and then gareth not envisaging what will happen at the wheel mark so you know these are some of the scenarios that you guys wanted to early in the week look at and so what i'm planning to do now is take on board uh, the point that rory said and 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 i what i heard then was flexibility and just run through some little scenarios so um does anybody have any other um ones if i just go back to oops this are there any other other issues you face so being pinned and not being able to attack off which is something that rory and pete said are there any other issues that you you sometimes face once you've started and you've you've got a plan that maybe means that you you can't execute your plan or are we all pretty happy no, a bit slow at the gate sometimes and maybe someone coming over the top or someone to lure coming up yeah just slightly forward of you yeah okay cool so um these are some questions we'll try and work through and, and obviously we'll try and attend to the, the stuff that, uh, that Rory and, and Pete and, and the other guys have, guys have said. So I'm just going to play you a little bit of virtual regatta here um, as a scenario to try and help provide a, a little insight into some of the things that we're, we're kind of talking about to give a little video um, perspective on it. And hopefully um, I'm just going to quickly stop share and make sure I've turned all the right settings on to make it play nicely. Uh, and then we'll play that and that'll give us some context to be able to um give you guys uh, a bit more a bit more ins insight um, there's big pin bias on the line it's starb attack lifted but you want to get right it's very poor end bias six five four three two one so i'm, I'm the yellow boat kind of sailing across. on this but it's the only start you went over on. No, oh, <laughs> Carlos. You're just bitter that I managed Maybe to nail not. this start. Yeah, I did get an amazing start. Let's see. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the game is a, is a game where you are obviously racing other people. But the, the key right, bit so. here for me was about there was a bias into the start line, which we sometimes see, we quite often see in... Um, in our neck of the woods and and so yeah and yet you wanted to get to the bit, right it's interesting on the old breeze strength because yeah, so at this stage here it was about making sure very... that um we'd come off the starting line there was a lot of pin and bias i got a good start i hadn't tacked and crossed very well but then i'd tried to get towards the right on a decent lane um, and we see this in limington quite often you know you've got a um, you've got a southwesterly and you've got uh, uh, an incoming tide. Yeah, so you've got wind and tide together coming from Hurst down towards you, and you want to get to the right hand side, uh, less so the, from a pressure side that we have here, but more from a tidal perspective of getting tidal relief on the right. But it's the same scenario. It's like come off the starting line, and what happened to me here? So I started at the biased end, but I was held by all these boats to my windward side and I tacked, but I, I infringed. So then the problem is, is that having started well, as, as, um, as Rory said, you know, Rory would want to be the boat here, this white boat. 
You agree, Rory? Yep. And why would you want to be the white boat, Rory? Because uh, I want to control the right-hand side. Yeah. And uh, hopefully some guys to lure of you will pin the other jokers out who, who may have won the start, may have got better starts than you have. Um, we'll keep pinning them beyond the favoured side of the course, keep them taking, taking them to the wrong side of the course while you sail in the good stuff. Yeah, so if I just do a quick doodle on the screen here for everybody's benefit. So what we're talking about is Rory's the white boat and Rory has started slightly up, up the, the start line here to be able to hold as long as he wants going this way until he wants to tack off. I, as the yellow boat, have started a little bit further down the line, which is a bit more biased and a bit more beneficial. But my problem is, is now I've, I can't tack and cross. So I might have got a great start, but my tack loss will put me into a collision with definitely him and him. So although I've done a great start, I'm now for our, if this is Limington, I'm now then committed to going this way until I am allowed to by Rory or and the pink boat. So when we think about how we want to start, sometimes it isn't the most important thing to take the biased, that take all the bias off the start line, unless you're going to make sure that you can tack across. Um, and, and, and quite often our race officers set a quite a biased start line is not quite so clear to see here, but quite a biased start line where this end um, on this top little left hand circuit is quite a long way up towards the river mark purely to spread the boats along the line because they know that in a southwesterly with a tide coming in most of the fleet of 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 racers are going to want to sail um on this kind of this sort of route here and they set a bias line to spread everybody along it now if you're very good at your starting you might be able to start and start here and tack and cross but it's a risk which is why rory's taking a more conservative approach but an approach that gives them control. And I think that's a really important part of what we see in Limington a lot is starting in a way that allows you to deliver your plan, which is the main reason for part of this video. So I'll just... Um, just adding to that at Limington, it's not unusual to be able to get out on port in those conditions. Coming across <coughs> on port. Uh, on, a lot, on lot, port a lot of people you. are crowding out the other end. They, they lay the pin in shore, the tide's against. And... It's quite often a strategy just to come off Baverstock on port. Yeah. Because the tide's so, so can, biased, and there's normally a gap. Yeah. So if we look at this now, so Carl's, uh, Carl Riley says, you know, um, if, if actually you started here on port, you've already got a free route out to the right. You normally go a bit further up just for safety because yeah. there's normally a bunch on that right hand end. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or, 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 or for sure, the safest, the safest possible one is to just nip behind these guys and get out that way. Yeah. But it yeah. depends how important it is to get that right hand side. You can assume it is. Yeah, we assume, <laughs> we assume it is. So I'll just, I'll just play the rest of this just to give you. So this was me. That's Rory. So even Rory's kind of pinned a little bit in this scenario here by this black boat, but there's a bit of space. And as we go further up the beat, um, uh, this is a little bit further up. This is kind of halfway up. So if you can see over here, the Rory boat is still going out that side because Rory's held by the black boat. Um, but I, I've managed to come out to the right. And so I'm then trying to make sure that I, uh, as a yellow boat, are getting towards the pressure in this example, um, but um, still keeping in phase of the shifts. Um, and then these guys all start to come out the right-hand side and I want to still put my... Um, my plan is to work to the right hand side so I want to tack up on the windward side of them to protect the right so I tack up and then as you come back across it's then about making sure that um, you can you know you know who you're racing in the fleet um, and for me in this instance I was kind of quite lucky that the the next thing that happens is a bit of a left shift but um, as we get into this last sort of couple of hundred meters then you need to start thinking about who you're racing against and which boats you need to sort of work to, work to attack or defend. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll just flip on to the next the next bit. So, um, I suppose the key bit. I'm just going to stop share now and, and just ask a, ask a couple of questions. So, 
we've just run through a little scenario um, with a bit of video to explain that um, in order to try and help people have a perspective on how important it is to execute a race plan. So um, Rory's explained what he might be trying to do in, in some of his races. Um, and what I'm going to do next is just try and run through a little scenario to reinforce again a little bit more about what we do when we're trying to plan and how it is important and why, why we might do it. And I'll try and get some people to interact to, to get a bit of value out of that. So um, I'm just going to go back and put the share screen on. Oops. Two secs. Let's go back to that play from current slide. And open that up. So sharing screen again, we're going to go from this one. Right, so. Right, so um, when we think about making our, executing our plan, it's about basically us being able to deliver the right skill at the right time automatically, regardless of circumstance. Yeah, so it's about making sure we've done enough practice to be able to achieve those things. And when we race, this is our course card. And you guys have all mentioned quite a lot about marks and where are they and, and how do we how do we make decisions around different wind directions? Um, and we see a lot of this sort of thing, although this is a uh, big boats, whatever. It was just trying to show how important it can be for some people to try and win an end without really thinking about what the rest of the the racetrack might might be providing them um so once we've decided on a plan which um i will uh i'm just gonna flip to the next oh i'm just gonna sorry apologies yeah so um this is a scenario that i want you to have a bit of a look at so um i'm just mentioning it but um when we think about our race course uh in a southwesterly so uh, Braverstock's here, um, and we've got a. We're going to be racing up to something like B or possibly A. Then already, what would a what would a plan that you'd want to be running to do that one be? Tony, what would you want to what's your, what would your race plan be to try and make sure that you did the best you could at uh, a beat that went from down here up to say A mark. On a windward leg. Oh, Hugh, can we have a tide height? Uh, tide height. Oh, um, the tide is it? Yeah. Let's uh, let's say it's a it's a it's a um it's an incoming tide, and you're at half tide. Muted that, Tony. Oh. We can't hear you, Tony. I think you're still muted. You lost your voice. Sorry, Robert. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, you. Uh, I'm just planning my sailing plan, not my racing plan at the moment. So can I go that to one of the uh, one yeah, of the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, anybody else? Any kind volunteers? So if it was a, a building incoming tide and the yellow yellow arrows are the arrows of wind. Uh, and the red arrows are the arrows of the tide. And um, we were starting by Braverstock here. Then so we're going Hugh. to A. Yeah, Jeff. So we're we're going to nail the shore. Copy. Uh, we've got we've got seaweed to manage. Yeah. Um, I'm a skiff, so I want to do less angles. Oh, yeah. Sure. So I'm going to face more tide and stay away from merlins and arrows yeah cool nice so, so i'm probably going to stay at an extra couple of hundred meters out shore whilst the others squeeze the shoreline okay um uh carl if you're sailing your arrow what's your approach to this race yeah i'm up the shore up the shore, just short yeah, tacking up the shore. There's no, there's no the preference pressure differential that Jeff's looking for outside. So there's, there's gonna be a pressure differential outside as well. Would land on the left. There'll be more pressure as you move out. Yeah. On the sea breeze, but you, it's a trade off against tide. And I don't think my arrow is gonna be enough. I don't get enough in the medium handicap boat. I don't think and Merlin might be just fast enough to pick that up and stand off a bit more. I've seen, but I think anything slower than that, 
maybe the Phantom, don't know, anything a bit slower though, you're up the beach. Yeah. Okay, we're done. And what about an expo? Kite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you're on the shore. <laughs> <laughs> my, so my plan would be to go up the beach to start with. Yeah. But as we get towards Pennington, the Serbu, I would be looking to defend the left-hand side of the beat because I know as I approach A, I'm going to get a right-hand lift and I'm going to get more pressure and I'm going to get less tide. So the danger is, as we get towards the end of that beat, that we're going to overstand. Yeah, so you're coming through here, end. Rory, but then you're not ha unhappy to do this. Is that right? Yeah. So, so early on in the beat, I'm going to be banging the shore and going to ground every now and then and hitting all sorts of stuff. Um, as we get further up the beat, I'm more focused on not overstanding A. Copy. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Good. Nice. A lot to... shallow. Sorry, up at A as well. It's a lot shallower, a lot further offshore. Yes. Yeah. You've got to watch for that, though, because there's a hole there as well by A. But that's a. So, so what I'm, what I'm hearing is some really, really good, um, really, really good uh, thinking going in and planning going in to what might happen. So what I've just heard um, verbalised in terms of what you do on the water, some really key principles about what's going on with the wind. And I deliberately put on the arrows in, in the angles that they are very specifically. So um, I was just trying to find my cursor on the screen. Um, if you look at the... Um, you look at the yellow arrows, it's been, I've exaggerated, but the, the yellow arrow in the middle of Hurst is the, is the, is the sea, the breeze at the surface of the, of the water, which is unaffected by land. You know, that's kind of the gradient, the gradient wind. And the wind that you see as the yellow ones is the wind that you will see at, which is um, affected by the drag of the, the wind blowing over the land. And as a result of the wind blowing over the land, it turns the breeze left. So that's hence Rory's consideration for not necessarily being in a position to um, want, not being so bothered about going back into the top right up by um, Keyhaven uh, too early because A, it's shallower across on that dark blue line and B, you'll get a little bit of a wind, a little bit of a left in the breeze potentially as you come in towards a so it's 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 a complex and interesting proposition is that is that what you guys would um would concur happy with that yes. so um so if we then i'm just going to try and get back out off this um this annotation thing because there we go right so um, i'm going to flick on to the next the next slide which is basically just another little way of, of, of showing and reinforcing that. So it's not quite so far up, but our start line was approximately meant to be Braverstock. This is kind of our course axis with the same wind coming in from the southwest and tide coming in as well. Then we've got more tide out to the left. We've got less tide into the right. And as you can obviously see, you know, people were keen to get into the shore for the left tidal relief early and then take their kind of long attack starboard attack to get up the up the racetrack. So um, why why have we been laboring this quite so much? Well, that's this scenario is very much playing to the Pete, Pete Barton question about starting and holding um, uh, starting to be able to then get to the get to the side you want to. And even if you don't start well, how do you get out of it? So hopefully we've answered that a little bit in Carl's comment earlier about, well, if you, if you know you're not quite going to get a really good start on starboard, you're just going to be on poor or certainly start in a position to be able to attack early is really crucial. So you can get to the side, the right-hand side that you want. Um, and the crucial bit for me in this is um, something that I actually put this slide on a bit too early for, but if we think about how we think our way around the race course, this roadmap is something I'm a big believer in. And um, the roadmap is my little description of how we are going to get from our start line to our women mark. And if I replay back to what Rory and Carl related to just earlier, then effectively they were doing several things 
and and this is over years and years of experience they'll have they'll have just gone oh yeah i definitely do that but if we if we have a plan and their plan was to work the right hand if we take rory's plan rory what was your plan your plan was to sail this side was it uh work the right early yeah and then defend the left late okay so it's it was and i'll just draw that on so rory's plan was this he's going to come off the start line and try and make sure he can sail out here and then he's probably going to come out of this side Oops, and then get a header as he comes across and then come up into the left here. Yeah, so that's Rory's plan. And Rory's going to start in a way that allows him to do that. And as we, if we relate back to that bit of video I showed you to begin with, with the white boat, then that was Rory because Rory didn't want to start all the way at the pin end of the start line. Rory wanted to make sure he could start in a place and in a location where he could have the option to tack off because that was important to him. I'm just trying to find my cursor. It seems to disappear on my screen. Two what seconds. What we have to just quickly remember, though, is that was an expert course, pretty much going up to a as a dinghy. We very we would never do that. Only in maybe a long distance race once or twice a year. Yes, but, but it's I, still a good thing to show. It's great. Yeah. So, so whilst going up to a absolutely is a is a thing that isn't necessarily what you are going to find you do a lot, and um, you probably have been more. Uh, going a shorter distance the the point is that I, the principle is what i'm interested in yep. so when we think about what we're we're doing on our race course there's some things that we regularly regularly do from uh how we execute our plan perspective and if we have a roadmap of what we expect to do then it makes it much easier in our brain because we've got our plan we come off the start line if we're delivering rory's plan he's come off the start line he's held a decent start but he can but he's made sure he can tack off so he tacks off and 30 seconds out of the line, or not long out of the line, are you are you guys chatting your plan, Rory, on board? Or what are you normally chatting about? Lunch uh, or speed, speed, height, checking speed. we're holding our lane. <laughs> very, very little conversations going on actually. It's normally me going, are we clear? Are we are we holding clear? And it will be very quiet on the boat. Okay. So really key in what Rory's just said there. Are we holding clear? Because Rory needs from his team some validation of is the plan still good? Yeah, and is, and the plan was to tack off. So am I going to be able to do that? Is effectively what he's saying from that comms. You know, so basically Rory is 30 seconds or not long out of the line because he knows he wants to tack, trying to validate if it's still the right plan to do. Just picking up on that Rory thing of clear, it's vital because it's such a one-sided course. And to get a free lane is so hard. So to lose what you're in is yeah. a disaster. Yeah. So I can see why there's emphasis there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, so as we go up the race course, then once it is that Rory goes up the race course, or and you know, and once if if Rory manages to tack out and cut across to there, then first third is a really important part of the race course to be able to make sure that you're checking in with. Did my plan work and am I doing okay? So for Jeff, Jeff, yeah. what would you be working through or thinking through at your first third in your boat? I I would be heading out another couple of hundred meters beyond the ley line to take the hit on the tide to get clear away, air away from the Merlins and the high the aero nines. I'd go out another two, three hundred meters to take the hit and then come back in. So if we just draw Jeff on here in red, so Jeff, you know, Jeff, if Jeff got a start, Jeff might actually have started on port because he wants to not do much boat handling. So he might start on port behind everybody. But actually, if that's Rory in an expo, then Jeff's probably going to want to come through here, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go out. Going to go out. This is, this is effectively our offshore, our deeper <laughs> water, um, less a more tide scenario, but let but, slightly more pressure potentially and less traffic. Yeah, and we're also probably going to be have left left tacks. Yeah, so we're going to go out, find some clear air, find a clear channel, and then come back in. Yeah. So really, what's what what are we what are we hearing here in this whole discussion around this first third? What's important for us to know at that point there? What are we trying to achieve at that first third? clear channel of air yeah so it's different for different boats but really for me it's 
did my plan work and am I needing to learn something new from what I'm seeing on the race course? Yeah. And if it, if I apply this same model to each race and I then go, Oh yeah, that works. Da, 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 then each time you come to do this again and again and again, your brain just starts to match patterns and identify, Oh, this is about the right time rather than you having to cognitively think about it. So one of the things with all my Olympic sailors, I stress to them time and time again is what, what are you going to be making a decision about at your first third? You will, uh, um, because we agree on the fact it's important to check in at the first third because we need to know what has happened in the race. Yeah, but once we get into expecting to make that decision and expecting to have that check in, then we can start going, oh, at that point, I might be considering this relative to boats around me. And for Jeff, it's pretty clear. I'm going to be tacking out before those guys. And that's a pretty standard play. You know, there's no doubt in your mind now that that's a standard play you'll execute. So effectively, each time you go into this race course, you can, you've already run it through in your head and you kind of know what, what you're then looking for are the cues that give you that I'm going in far enough, but not too far. Yeah. So you're already by creating a plan in your head, then you're already simplifying what your brain has to do to process, which is the kind of the, the beauty of having this, um, this having a roadmap and working your way around the roadmap. Uh, so I'm just going to try and get this annotation off. Apologies. It's, it's a little tricky on zoom. Oops. There we go. So um, we see what our 30 seconds out of the line is. We then check in at our first third to make sure we're aware of did the plan work and what. And, and then we just start going through another check in at the second third of what next. And so um, Carlos, in an arrow, what's your kind of route or what, what would you be considering asking yourself as a what next at your second third? Um, I'm starting to think about who am I racing as I'm going into that top mark and how's that going to tee up for the bear away onto the run? Cool. Yeah. So already starting to think ley lines, how many people are, am I around? Am I going to be clear ahead of lots of people? Am I going to be duking it out with four or five others? You know, in the uh, in the area, you've got a boat that sails at similar speeds to quite a few other boats. So you might be racing lasers. You might be racing some solo. You might be racing all sorts of different boats. I hope we're not racing solos. We're probably clear by, clear <laughs> them by then. We're not doing very well if we are. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> you've got to be it's literally really light. It's, it's really light. Once, once well, Tony's got his solo up to warp speed, you'll be under threat. Yeah, from I doubt he'll be all over me. He's a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the key bit, the key bit as we get past the halfway point is then starting to be clear on our plan of how we keep free and keep out of trouble as we get into the top of the course so that we don't get into a situation where we end up with a lots of traffic in, a, in, in on our ley line to a couple of hundred metres out last thing we want to do is be on starb attack with a hundred meters to go because you just become a target. So the earlier we can start having that thinking plan about, and as Carl nicely put it, who am I racing? You know, so Rory, Rory sailing up here on the blue line, when he gets to this third might be like, okay, I've got, I don't know, Phil Lawrence to my right. Um, I've got Nick Froud to my left. I've got, Blah, I don't know, two or three other boats. Maybe you've got a couple more boats to your right that at the inshore lines help them a little bit, but you're then starting to weigh up the pros and cons and the risk and reward of where you are relative to those guys. And by making sure you check in again at that second third, it just triggers your brain into knowing and expecting to start making some future decisions. Look, you're about to ask a question, Rory. Yeah, we... <sighs> In the expo, and I think you can do this in most two-handed dinghies, so it's quite important to people with their scorpions and merlins. I'm constantly asking the question, how are we getting on? How's our height? How's our speed? How's our height? How's our speed? The whole, whole time. 
and I've got a pretty good idea of where we are in the race. So if we're doing badly, I'll certainly know. If we're doing quite well, I'll certainly know. But even in the middle, I'm trying to work out whether what we're doing is working. And if it's not working, then I need to change my plan. Um, and I need to adapt and work out how to get in a better place. Um, so are you talking about relative boat speed close on boats? Or are you talking about boats across the course because you think you might have made a bad decision? Boats across the course. So how are you going to correct that though? If you say if you've got so much separation by now, how are you going to rescue that? Um, it's all about risk and reward. So I know that on the left hand side of the course, this particular course, we're going to get more pressure. Um, and further up the beat, we're going to get less tide. And I know that the guys on the right, if we're doing badly, I know that the guys on the right are likely to overstand. And that's the same whether you're sailing an aero or an expo, they're all likely to form yeah, a big queue. Gets us at the top, yeah, and you curve in, yeah. Mm. They're gonna form a big queue on that right-hand side is what Q was alluding to earlier. Mm. So, but the important thing is getting decent information, but not too much information, so we can still steer the boat fast. I like it. Really good, you know. So that for me really clearly describes the importance of the team being able to paint a picture for the person who's making the decisions. And one of the things that's really uh, and the team make decisions. Don't get me wrong, but when you're the skipper and you're really focused in some of these conditions on making a boat go fast, having the ability for the people in the team to talk a great picture. And I talk, I talk about painting the picture. You know, so when you're on the boat as the crew, um, you you need to be absolutely brilliant at describing relatives. And when we talk about relatives, if we've got, if you look at my my picture at the moment um, and my hands, you know, relatives is lateral, fore and aft, bow down, bow up. You know, so super super important that as you're sailing up in your expo and you're doing, you know, two point nine knots. Um, <laughs> Not that fast. <laughs> Really? No. <laughs> um, you know, maybe 2.8 then. Um, but yeah. anyway, so, you know, um, but as you're doing all that amazing momentum, having pushed off the dock, then um, you've got to keep it somehow. And by making sure you're really clear on the relatives to the other people, then that's that's painting that picture. And then as Carl nicely asked, you know, if we think about if my fingers are the people going up the track, uh, on starboard tack you know if you're if rory's the one in the middle here he needs to know and be really clear in his race plan from the description of the other guys of you know um if this guy and if the wind's coming down the page this is guy to lewis you can probably see him but you're not quite sure that guy and this guy's a bit of an outlier so having the ability for your team on your boat and for you if as you're a single-handed sailor to to sail on autopilot such that you can look out and really get a colourful picture is super, super important. And we talk in sailing a lot about sailing on autopilot. How much people actually do going and sailing and shutting their eyes, I don't know. Um, but it's a, something that I massively advocate because why do we do it? Well, we do it to help that specific bit. When you aren't able, when you have to look around, You've got to be able to know that you're still going to be able to sail the boat at like 90% or whatever it is. And so I, I shut sailing <laughs> as long as you're not necessarily doing it close to other boats and get likely to crash is a really good skill to learn and develop. Um, so what am, I, what am I saying? What we kind of sort of seeing here is checking out the line, checking out the first word to see if your plan has worked. Then at the second third, we're starting to do the what next. Am I sailing in a pack of boats coming in from a side? And if I am, as Rory nicely put it, if Rory's sailing up the middle here and they're going to come in on port and he sees five boats already on starboard, the last thing he wants to do is tack into that pack early. He's probably going to want to keep separated and come in a little bit later such that they can all make make themselves slow and come in on a little shift at the end and equally in the aero um you might be you know dusting up this shore to get in sort out the tide but actually carl you know would you want to be on the ley line here 
No, I'm no. going to go shift later on. Yeah. And so having chatted with Dave and Carl a bit, we've got what we call a shift ley line and I'll just draw it on the page here in, a, in another color um, to just give everybody a, a perspective on what that is. So when we, when we sail up our race course, one of the key rules of thumb that I really encourage people to remember and to try and um, think of early at this first, at this second third is this bit around which we call the shift ley line. So I'm just going to draw, oh, there we are, that's where I'm. Um, Right, so if you're if you're on the ley line, you're here, but tacking out, tacking on the ley line in the corner is a bad idea because you've then got one shift that you're hoping is going to stay in for the whole beat, and the likelihood of that is pretty small. Or you go overlay and then there are lots of people. But the place you want to tack if you're going to approach the rim of mark, and obviously scale is a bit strange here, but is is to tack below the starboard ley line because if the wind lifts on starboard then you might lay the women mark yeah i've seen rory win loads of races doing this yeah in his expo and a long on a long line in it always looks yeah. low yeah well nobody's here listening they don't know yeah <laughs> so so rory tax rory rory tax in the left hand of the two yellow lies the wind yeah. goes right and rory lays I'm what always happened? above that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Carl's above it. And, I'm above and I, the yellow, yeah. yeah. Um, if, um, let me just, uh, let me just try and do this again. So I'm not, I can actually see my cursor. Um, two seconds. Let's just put this down here. My, my rule um, of the expert was if you could see the mark around the front of the jib, you, you weren't laying it. <laughs> In the top. <tub>. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so, you know, so Rory, Rory and Carl are like, yeah, we want to start, we want to basically tack out of that right hand side under the ley line. So that if it lifts, I lay, and if it heads, well, if it heads, I just take a shift up. Yeah. And everybody's so nervous about tacking twice. Absolutely paranoid of not tacking. But you figure how much dirty wind you're going to sail in if you sail up that starboard side of the course for 200 meters is absolutely colossal. I think so, where I get nervous there is, if, I mean, this is okay on a non-tidal course, but at Lymington where you might be going out to sea or especially B mark or something, and Rory will correct me on this, if it's lightish wind and the tide gradient is twice what it is on the shore, you get very nervous about that last tack. That I was used to, but I mean, what's your view, Rory? Because I mean, you. Uh, so there's two things are going on. So yes, you are going to get more more tide, but also you're going to get more wind, and you will get a right hand lift as you get towards the mark. So I've, I've watched the jar. I I learned from this, watching the Jardines do it to me time and time and time again. <laughs> you think there's no way they're going to lay that mark, and every single time they did, every single time they did, and. The problem is by joining the queue, basically, if you're not first in the queue, you're going to have to sail a lot further. If you're sixth or seventh in the queue, you're having to sail probably an extra 200, 300 metres to get some clear air. Um, so, so quite often it's worth going a bit early, having the clear air all to yourself, and then... Yeah, okay. Everybody says you're lucky, but sometimes the luck. I've, I've seen you do this a lot, so I know it works. So sometimes the luck. Well, you do it as well, don't you? It, yeah, it's slow. Yeah. So you'll come out. You will get more pressure. Bizarrely, you'll get more pressure on the left, uh, and normally that wouldn't work because of the tide. But because you're going to get this right hand lift at the same time, you, you have to you have to calibrate that and have to be have that in your plan um yeah. it's quite hard it's not easy is it kid no and you know don't get me wrong this isn't like the only lesson to come out of this discussion tonight i'm i'm really grateful that you guys have been sharing these these opportunities because you know as we've seen jeff in the faster boat is going to sail more offshore but equally you know part of the reason jeff's sailing offshore is for exactly this reason he doesn't want to get into all the dirty wind of being near the other boats and we sail in handicapped fleets, so there's just all sorts of different, you don't know what the dirty wind is. And, and actually, when you sail in handicapped fleets, it's, it's very much like sailing in big fleets in, 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 in big fleets in single-handed, uh, in, sorry, in, in one design fleets, 
because you're having to factor in the impact of the dirty wind. Um, and so having the simple rules of thumb, which Carl calls shift lay line at that last third, and Rory will just know it, is this really important thing to just have in the back of your mind that just is a quick fit, is a quick reminder that's like, if in doubt, when I come towards that starboard lay line, I'm going to tack under the boats. Because you don't want to be doing the extra 200 metres and two tacks isn't that much of a penalty if you're three lengths down from everybody else who's slowing each other down. Um, uh, hopefully that's provided a little bit of a, uh, an insight into a tool there, um, which gives everybody a little structure. So what I'm advocating, I'm advocating that in your planning, you have a roadmap. And in your roadmap, you check in at the first, you know, make sure that straight off the line, you're pretty happy with your plan. But you definitely check in at the first third of what others did to learn from it. And the second third, you try and make sure you're upfront planning for the top for your approach. And then that helps for the downwind as well. Um, so we'll just try and there we go. And then, and then obviously that, that last approach is then your, your execution of your approach into the top mark. Um, I'm just going to try and now get rid of all of that drawing on the screen so um i obviously went through this a little bit earlier so we can just quickly smash through that um this is our example that we sh we've talked through and then we've just added a bit more color to um oops. so what am i saying well basically when we go upwind then our rules of thumb that you could apply at those checking points are constrained by a couple of things. So they're constrained by like what the wind is likely to be and what our environment is, um, what our ability and our knowledge is to sail, how to sail the boat, and then our what we know the rules of thumb, our shift ley line. So when we get to each of those thirds, then all we're doing is trying to go, is it still shifty? And I position relative to it being shifty and positioning and positioning is like what I do boat to boat or am I as I get to each checking point thinking oh actually it's a game feature it's like a last shift coming to the top mark and then I'm going to basically do my positioning relative to that so this little Venn diagram on the right is aimed at trying to help people as they get to each of those checking points understand and know how to execute their plan if it changes as they go around the race course um, and to sort of come to the end these are these are then just some little upwind rules of thumb that over time i've helped develop with people which just give you a a small insight into what to use at those checking points as you go around the race course so um as you go to your first third, you'd say, um, your first third, you'd say, okay, what are my priorities and what have I learned from the first third? And if you said it was about the right-hand side and about tide, then it's a gain feature and position. You're still sailing to that priority. If, you're, if you think that the tide is not significant because you're up in that shallow bit, um, that Roy was talking about towards A, then actually it might be different and you might then be about it being shifty in position. As Rory described, actually at, the, at a certain point when you get past that groin, you're more interested in the shift. So as we go up our race course and round those checking points, we need to factor in how the way we prioritise might change. Um, and so that this is something that I'll go through in at a later date um, uh, to give everybody a bit more of an idea of how that actually works but it's just a little tool to help you keep reminding yourself of am I still delivering a plan which is go right yes at the first third but remember in my second third that I'm going to be sailing for shift and position to Rory's answer because at the top of the course is more important for the wind than the tide for instance yeah, so have a way of working around how you prioritise as you go around the race course, which is that little tool. And a couple of other little rules of thumb 
you know, you're always trying to sail towards the next game. Yeah, which is what people call usually the long tack. Yeah, so you come off the start and you try and sail the long tack first, the tack that takes you towards the winner mark as your first priority so that you end up making sure that you've got the lion share towards the point you want to get to the quickest. Um, this third point is to answer Simon Gaiman's point uh, of earlier week, which is people have gone either way and I'm in the middle. Ah! We've all been there. And it's so hard. You decided you want to go start at the pin end of the start line because that's the biased end of the line. And you get a, a quarter to a third of the way out the beat, and all of a sudden you see Rory, Carl, and Rory and Carl on the beach mud hopping, and you're like, "Oh my gosh, uh, oh, uh, 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 uh. what do I do? What do I do?" And and you know, and if you're Jeff at that stage, you then might be, "Oh, do uh, do I change my plan? Do I go there or whatever?" You know, and actually at that point, you have to be really solid with what your plan was and go, "I just have to do." what I decided in my plan I've spent 30 minutes working out to do and I'm going to commit to doing what I know is right for me rather than change my mind. Because if I change my mind, then I don't win relative to the people I'm near. I lose to them and then I'm chasing something that's happening over the other side of the course. Does that make sense? Yeah. Quite, quite often in an expert race, you'll see the guy on the right make you a pretty radical course Guy on the left, make a pretty radical course. And they'll come into the top mark together. Yeah. And the guy in the middle? Gets mm -mm. burned. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's exactly that. It's exactly my point. It's win where you're in. If you are the winner out of a side, there's a pretty damn good reason you went that way. And if you commit to that plan, then generally you'll be successful. And at least you'll have beaten everybody on that side. But if you get halfway in there and then you get the heebie-jeebies and then you try and chase to something and you see somebody else getting on the other side, you will lose to both. So get a plan, stick to the plan and execute the plan because at least then you get the feedback of what your plan was and what was good about it. Um, in a future talk, we'll talk about my idea about an arrowhead, but basically having positional control relative to other people as a big mass of boats is important and we'll go into that another time um, i think my fifth one is absolutely vital for sailing don't duck groups and in each boat there'll be a different number of boats that is a group i always think that more than two is a group yeah so don't duck more than two boats there's a pretty good reason there on the other tack normally um, and uh, and if you have to duck two boats, then usually you've sailed through two lots of dirty air to get to a side where probably the shift's about to go back the other way. So unless it's vital, vital, don't duck boots groups and shift ley line. So tack underneath the pack of motorway coming in from the side, so that you are near the middle, such that when there's an opportunity to gain on a shift later, you can gain on it rather than be in the motorway with no options and everybody reaching over you or giving you bad wind. Um, that's been a bit of a download for me in the last um, slide. I have more, but um, I could just, no, I'm not going to do that one. I could, I have more, but I don't want to do more now because I think we've had some great insights from you guys. It's been nice to get the match of Aero, Expo, uh, Skiff, uh, and I suppose I'd open it to the floor to um, have I managed to cover off some of the questions that were asked earlier in the week and to address some of the little insights that people were seeking. Silence. Yeah. I think it should be asked to Simon, Gareth and Pete. Where are those gent young men? Peter Barton. I'm going to stop sharing. Where is he? I'm going to try and get everybody in gallery. Um, is there um, uh, for Simon? Simon Gaiman. Simon, does that does that does that help 
provide some insights that were um, troubling your brain earlier in the week. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I think reality is some of it's just confidence because that you know that classic situation where you're heading for the shore, downwind out of the tide, and you see a bunch of people just heading direct to the mark, and you think, ah. Oh, is that right or not? And I think, yeah, sometimes you just got to go with your gut and but and really commit to your plan and and, and get on with it and, and forget everyone else. And I, I think that comment you made at the end, which is think about who you're really racing against at that point, it's the people near you rather than the people over the other side of the course, because you you just lose altogether if you um if you if you focus on both of them. So yeah, it's very helpful. Pete, did we get near to answering or discussing your proposition? Yes, I think so. And there's obviously there's one more thing than either tack or keep going. There's say a low fast mode or a high slow mode can extend the time you can keep your your lane for. Yes. And it just differs for different boats. Um, if you've got a fast planing skippy boat, you can you've got quite a wide angle you can sail over high and slow or low and fast and you might just keep your lane going for an extra 150 yards which would be enough to get to the shore yeah yeah really, thanks for that that's great so all these as we get back into going sailing you no know, moding is a really valuable important tool and and, uh, and i'd remind us of the conversation that rory and, and carl were in about the relatives bit because when you're in a when you're in a single-handed boat actually being able to sail on autopilot and do that moding thing sort of subconsciously is really vital. So you can keep, or am I, am I bow down and gaining now or am I holding? You know, so having the ability to, sorry, you were going to say. Um, yeah. So I, I really like that moding super, super critical and super important. Um, Jeff, Catherine, Any um, any queries or questions from our skiff orientated side of things? Uh, no, not really, guys. It's just uh, one would be a safety point um, when we're out there in 15 to 18, 25 knots is we're not always entirely in control <laughs> or can see what can see what's happening. So please be aware of that one. How are we um, feeling <laughs> seaman like, Jeff? <laughs> we're, we're, of course we're seeming like <laughs> you can't see where you're going <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's not my boat i've got i've got a crew on board to watch out for me it's the yes 700 yeah, yeah okay <laughs> we're in a different guy, fleet. it's fine it's fine <laughs> but Lil, lily will be on the blah 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 blah, blah, blah shortly <laughs> is he in here serious abuse um <laughs> but no no <laughs> uh, lovely presentation uh, really good. Thank you. No worries. I, I realise other people inputted into stuff earlier in the week, and, and Catherine had had uh, had a, had a message earlier on. Um, but has, has anybody got any other questions or any other uh, things uh, now to please please say I'd like this for next week? Um, I know that with uh, Claire and Stuart, we've got a bit of skiff sailing as well. So my intent for next week was to do something a little raw more around some some of the doing of the sailing. Uh, so to pick up on some of the things that people have said in this talk around Pete's comment, Modi, you know, and, and some of the, some of the, the actual skills of doing the sailing so that we can tease out some of the real tricks of the trade that people do and use to make sure that they're sailing super fast and sailing the right angles. Pete. I think um, a real challenge. It's very easy to see, Maybe the tide's against you, so you've got to go inshore. But the difficulty comes in quantifying the different parameters which affect your decision-making to create your plan. Yeah. So the big one is how fast does your boat go through the tide, whether yeah. you've got a fast boat or whether it's a windy day. Yeah. And that will depend on quite how much you only go for the tide in a light wind day on a slow boat, or you might be more tempted to go off into the tide against you if you had a faster boat. So there's a lot of quantifying of the different parameters, isn't there? That's a that's a classic for the Phantom. If I get dragged, if if the arrows are creeping up the side 
of the bank in amongst the weed and trying to stay out the tide. If I get dragged in amongst them, I'm toast. If I stand off a bit and sell my own plan and my own race and don't get fooled into it, then I'll probably arrive at the windward mark ahead of them and then can gain. But if I get dragged into tacking up the bank with them, it always fails. Can I, can I just add something, Henry, which, which you'll love? And Because Rory's on the call, he won't mind me quoting. I've learned a lot from Rory over the years. He, he grew up here, and as did Catherine. And Rory's got a lovely expression. What are you doing with them anyway? And <laughs> meaning you should, you should be out and gone in a big boat. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. It's a lovely expression, but it, it, yeah. I think it applies. You, say, you, you have to ask uh, yourself the question is, why am I sailing with these people? That's right, exactly. That was it, wasn't it? Whenever you get into trouble and you're getting frustrated, it's like, <laughs> what am I doing here? It's normally because yeah. we've, we've started in the river and I was still putting my boat in the water when the gun went. Oh, well, that's <laughs> all going to change now, isn't it? We're all over that. Yeah. I, I just uh, I just had to give the full story because it's a bit rude not to. Uh, Go on. <laughs> Carl was having a, a massive argument with the same people every week. And to be quite honest, <laughs> the only time I ever saw them was on the mooring. And I said, Carl, you're a way better sailor than that. What on earth are you doing sailing next to them? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I may, that's stuck with me I ever may. since so you know rather than getting frustrated it's just like yeah this is just a bad one write it off don't worry about it move on <laughs> and, and, uh, my comment is what could a skiff sailor be doing arguing with a bunch of merlins and arrows well, there is that and you and you've started five minutes ahead of us <laughs> uh, thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> oh, so can one. i <laughs> Can I just ask uh, ask some questions? Last questions. So for next week, what would be uh, what would you like us to build on from so far? What's been useful? What's been good? What what's helped? And what would you like more of? And what would you like less of? So the road plan's been really helpful. Yeah, um, that's been really good. The Automatic sailing has been really good. Yeah. Uh, uh, how to how to do that automatic sailing? I mean, for me, one of my skills is I try and look over my shoulder and still sail. So yeah. sailing blindfold doesn't really help me, but sailing, looking over my shoulder and keeping the speed on is is pretty important. Yeah. Uh, but it's just that the sailing skills bit is is really important. I think. Yeah. That sailing on autopilot is really tricky at Livington in the chop. Especially in the ex-boat, but anything where you miss a wave, yeah, well, you've, anyway. lost, you've lost your boat then, so you've lost whatever it is, and you, you know, you've lost your lane, whatever, just by. But equally, be uh, careful when you can do it. Is is it would be my, you know, how do you get better at that? My recent aero experience um, taught me that I, I really struggled noticing when I had weed and didn't have weed uh, because I wasn't calibrated into the boat, but also. I was looking around the boat, so I would as much as I would do in the X boat. Yeah. And yeah. immediately I was down speed. So the so, thing to, the thing that gives you the clue for weed for everybody else is you lose height very quickly. So even if you're not sure about your speed, if you're not close to someone, you'll feel yourself falling in. So as the foils stop working properly, you definitely drop away. Anything to add to that, Pete? You're good on this. Well, I, I like to check my centre board very frequently, and I think it's worth practicing being able to get it up and down and in our arrows, we're quite lucky. I can I can lean in from the toe strap, spin double, and it's up and down on the beach. So I could do it several times a beat. Getting, so getting off the rudder is quite right, hard, isn't it? Drives me nuts uh, watching him. I, I'm quite <laughs> confident, but I've checked my board more recently than a boat next to me, which yeah. is you know fantastic. Yeah, I, I just get so distracted. Like, what's he doing? Just stop but it. Sail the boat. The boat's got to practice it, and the two man boats with their centre boards, you know, Merlin can probably do it easily enough, I should imagine. Yeah. Um, it's a bit easier in a centre board boat, isn't it? But I was saying the aero, or a lot of boats where it wraps around the rudder, and we're on a fixed rudder as well. That's quite a trick to get it off there, and that's really vital as well. Heel and stab. Heel and stab yeah. or through the tack, or whatever it is you're going to try and do. But with the Phantom, you roll tack, and as you go over, you waggle the rudder. Get the rudder right out the water, raggle the rudder in it. Your Honour. 
<laughs> I was just needing to get the weed clear. Why I attacked 50 <laughs> times up that beat. This is doer, yeah. It's never not. It's never that light wind when we're always in there, though, where there's weed about. It's always a sea breeze and banging. Well, here's hoping. Well, yeah. It's yeah. going to be like that every time we go sailing in the near future. Every time. We've got it dialed in. God's, uh, God's been paid off. Tony's kind of... got onto him. Tony is God. <laughs> well, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I'm hearing is uh, moding. Uh, maybe expand on the roadmap a little more. Maybe provide a few more of those rules of thumb, sort of some evidence of some of those bits to try and bring to life a little bit. Maybe I was, did the video thing work? The virtual regatta video was that useful? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. So okay, we'll have a little look at that. It was Can better I just watching a point? it than actually doing it. No, it's not. I was just going to say quite the opposite. Is I've been doing this with Hugh since when did you start doing it? April time, Hugh. Yeah. I've been sitting in almost on a weekly basis with you doing the virtual regatta, and not really for game playing, but as a simulator and to reinforce that rules of thumb stuff we've shown you. And it's a great way to do it away from just your normal dinghy sailing where you, you know you you can just focus on that and okay. that boat auto speed don't worry about the handling and everything else but you can really see what's happening and a debrief afterwards to see how that's gone and focus on one of those things so that those basic rules you know arrow head long tack shift lay line all that stuff is mad and making a plan and it's on it because you're doing it every three or four minutes it's a really good way of reinforcing it Speeds up your decision making massively. Yeah, it's compressed, and it really, when it comes to it, and we'll, we've had it. We've, <laughs> ironically, in all that time, we've probably only done four or five races, but it, uh, yeah. Definitely. I, personally, I don't like it. I just, I find it irritating. But then oh, I, don't well, like, I don't like computer games. So it's how you. Well, it's not a game, but it's how you approach it and, and yeah. what you're getting out of it. I'd never go on it and just play it, but <laughs> to get to get this stuff, you know, when you you with people and you've got to focus on it. I mean, Dave and I used it for communications, you know, how we talk to each other in the boat. We, we applied it in that and it worked really well. So there's lots of ways you can use it. And there I are, think, other, sorry, there are other things I got from, I, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a gamaholic with this VR thing. Like um, it, you? There are there's some things that I use quite a lot and there are some things that I, I'm focusing on and thinking about. So things like where the ley lines are. So if it's a really steep, ley line sorry shallow ley line on on port you can work out where the bias is for example um you cannot you need this auto sail which it gives you you can you, you press the b button and, and that's what i'm saying so you're not focusing on sailing the boat it's the automatic apply the automatic the speed is there for you yeah and those nice painted ley lines really help quite a lot as well I'm going to miss those when we go sailing properly. They're on the right. water, Rory. They're on there. If you pay Tony <laughs> off enough, he'll, he'll paint them on the water for you. Absolutely. There's painted ley lines in the start New line. Zealand, they're all over the place now. I've yeah. On the yeah. Telly. Mate, amazing. The painted amazing. start line is, is also pretty handy, but the one I'm going to miss the most is the deliberate foul on the port tack start. <laughs> where, if you're sailing a J70 on their, on their starts, if you foul on port, You'll beat everybody as long as there's a big enough port bias. Yeah, cross through the <laughs> So, Simon, you've done quite a bit of this with us as well. What, what was your findings? Yeah, I, what I found really helpful is, I mean, the, I've only really got back into sailing in the last 18 months, two years, and um, what I found really helpful is being able to practice tactics without worrying about... Um, sailing the boat yeah, so all the things you said about the boat just sails itself you know you can tack in two and a half seconds or whatever it takes you know you can hoist the spinnaker in three seconds so you don't worry about staying upright waves all that stuff you can just focus on big fleet um tactics and and boat positioning and that sort of thing so i found it incredibly helpful i, I suppose you know this this opportunity is something that isn't for everybody and I totally get that and um, I think what has become very apparent from sessions like this, and, and, and kind of I I just think of all these opportunities, like our discussions this evening is a tool. It's a tool for us to expand uh, your visibility of how other people do things. And 
little ways that are different but help reinforce the same messages are great for us for re- for identifying patterns and we have when we're sailing and when we're doing sport 99.9 percent of the time we've got so much information we're trying to absorb we haven't got time to be able to process from first principles so the reason i developed my roadmap because i'm like Guys, you haven't got time to think about this stuff and work out what to do brand new every time. Therefore, if you do any other sport or if you were going to go and drive from here to Newcastle, you get a roadmap. You wouldn't try and work it out by looking at every sign. You'd have your, your, your phone telling you where to go. It's a roadmap. So what we need to do in our sailing is help generate ways of reducing the cognitive load on our brain it's already hard enough for you sailing in a boat so actually by doing some practice thinking around when i at least thinking about i expect to make a decision before the start for my race plan how do i make a race plan hopefully i've had a bit of an idea how i do that today i've got a race plan right as i get onto the race course i'm going to check that plan at the first third i'm going to check again at the second third because those are the two points i get to validate what my plan was and I then get to prompt my brain into expecting to make the next decision. And my point is that if you ex- if you work this roadmap into expectancies of checking in at a third and a second third, then you then start to expect to make similar decisions. Your similar decisions are then rules of thumb, which you can go, when a starb attack boat does this, I do this. When a pack of five boats do that, I do that when I get towards the star belay line in the last third, I will tack underneath. You know, so before you know it, by having a road map and then expecting to check in to then assess against some, is it time to apply tacking bow forwards? Is it time to apply going past and tacking to the right if it's going to be a right-hand shift at the end? You know, so all of these little things, I think we do with these, vr and these chats is starting to condition your brains into having to do less cognitive work when you're underwater Make it so it just makes it easier because yeah. you're like go to the computer in your brain select that file play and my frustration has always been seeing people make the same mistake time and time again because they get into the moment and they just get flustered because i haven't thought about the simple plan to execute and if they try and principle go for first principles every time nine times out of ten they're just there's too much noise in their head they've reduced bandwidth and they can't can't compute so it's just about simplifying stuff and that's what i'd like to help you guys with going forward is let's do things that help us know how to first two talks were about practice and working out how to practice and henry's gone away and done some boat stuff and now now my feeling is that we need to then look at some autopilot how do we get better at going underwater and getting better at sailing in a boat what's that look like how do we do it how do we do moding differently in different types of boat and then the other bit i'm hearing is let's do some things that help reinforce to you guys about checking at a third what might i consider between as the rules of thumb checking at a second third what might i consider between so maybe by the time we've done a couple more sessions you're like and my first third i'm thinking long tack and leading out of corners and my second third, I might be shift lay line and who am I racing? Yeah. So as you go up your next race in your next chance to get on the water, you've got four rules of thumb. You'll apply two at the first third and two at the second third, which hopefully will make the time you come to make those decisions a shitload easier because you've not had to think about, oh, 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 oh. you've gone, is it this scenario? Oh, I recognize that pattern, plug and play. And that's my sales pitch. If you want in, that's what you've got to come back for next week. We will. Cheers, King. Super, Hugh. Thanks. I'm just going to have to go away and find the swear words from Matt uh, that we can remove before we can upload this video to the... Uh... <laughs> if you leave that with me, Tony, I'll sort it out. Are you sure? Yeah, Thank yeah. you very much for that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so, Carl, every apologies. time he says the S word, you have to replace it with Megan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, easy, don't. Oh, we missed it. Oh, no. <laughs> it's on now. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to watch that. Definitely. Uh, great. Um, hope, uh, was that okay? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so, uh, what I'd really like is I will um, 
ask some questions on the group chat. And if you can enthuse other people to answer some stuff, then that'd be great because the mo that was really helpful, you guys posting some, I'd like to know this so that we can form around what you guys want to do. We just check everyone's on that group chat. So it's a WhatsApp group we've got yeah. called Team Limo Sailors. Have you? Well, it isn't. Nick, are you on it? I don't think I'm you are. I'm not it. sure I am. No. Nick, Jeff, no, you're banned. <laughs> no, nah, I'll sort you out, darling. I'm am, on I'm, I'm on am I on it? Nick, I'm not sure you are. I'll, I'll make sure. Thank you. Oh, Carl, can I go on it as well, please? But Henry, as long as we keep the politics out of it. It's Alan. Alan, sorry, Alan, Mr. Markham, you're there. You've moved to Livington. I have, yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you who don't know Alan, Alan is an Aero and Merlin legend. Oh, you're Ooh. overstating your overstating the case not. there. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. I'll sort you out. Yeah, that's cool. Alan, can you give us a photo? Yeah, what do you look uh, like? <laughs> Come on, switch yourself, put yourself on. Oh. Are you still surrounded by boxes? Is that what's going on? That's Not right. There you go. That's what you look like. That's right. Alan was out with us in Australia last, was it last year? Can't remember. Yeah, a year ago, yeah. A year ago. Yeah. Yeah, cracking time. And Garda. And Garda, yeah. He's all, he's all over it. <laughs> Oh, guys, I'm going to shoot, but uh, lovely to see you all again and uh, look forward to next week. Thanks so much. Thanks Cheers so much. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.